A common accusation levied against Naughty Dog is that their games are only as powerful and effective as their narratives. This makes sense on the outset, considering that their games usually rely on character development, flashy graphics, and high-budget action sequences that make you feel as though you're playing through an interactive summer blockbuster. However, since we're going back through the Uncharted games for these critiques, I can't help but feel as though this estimation is limited. What I mean is that there's a lot more to Naughty Dog's games than just the narrative, and I think that Uncharted 2 is a perfect example of this. You see, Uncharted 2's story is crap. In addition, the original Uncharted story is also crap. These games did not claw their way into gamers' hearts and memories by way of magnificent storytelling. It was something more. You see, over the last few weeks as I prepared for this video, I went back through and played the entirety of Uncharted 1 and through all of Uncharted 2. I dug through a plethora of Reddit postings from the time of the game's releases and then also more contemporary examples, and I also consulted with many viewers, just like you, on Twitter and Instagram. After doing all of this, one thing is very clear. Uncharted 2 is successful in spite of its narrative, not because of its narrative. Now, to be honest, at the start of this project wherein I am critiquing every game in the Uncharted series from Naughty Dog's primary studio, I did not think that this would be the case. Perhaps I have rose-tinted glasses, remembering these games more fondly than they deserve, or I was simply too young to comprehend all of the myriad issues present in these games. But, having revisited them for the series, it's clear to me that there are a lot of problems present in Uncharted 2, the one game in this franchise that the majority of people seem to claim as their favorite. Now don't get me wrong, Uncharted 2 is uniquely Uncharted. In fact, it's the first game in the franchise which actually feels like an Uncharted game. This should, of course, come as no surprise considering that it's only the second entry, and considering the fact that the original game was more like a hodgepodge of 15 different ideas than it was a coherent, thought-out presentation of one creative genius's vision. The sequel, though, Uncharted 2, has some of the most memorable action sequences of any of these games. It's the first time you really feel as though Nathan Drake is a human being with whom whom you can relate, and it marks the first time that Naughty Dog, as a studio, focused on character arcs and interaction. Part of the reason that the latter is the case is due to the fact that for the majority of the game, Nathan Drake is going to be exploring areas of the game world with another character. Naughty Dog calls these companion sections. In effect, Naughty Dog can do a lot more by way of character development, exposition, and interaction if they pair Nathan Drake with somebody else. In Uncharted 2, you're paired with people like Chloe, Elena, or even this guy. His name is Tenzin, and he's a remarkable example of the power that gameplay can have in building a relationship with a character, because you see, Tenzin doesn't speak English. He speaks some sort of Tibetan tongue, meaning that the only way by which he can communicate with Nate, and therefore the player, is with either simple gesticulations or by leading the way himself. I actually think that these Tenzin sections are responsible for much of the success that we saw with The Last of Us. When you play that game, you'll realize that the overwhelming majority of gameplay time pairs the player with another character. And this is something that Naughty Dog has done consistently in every game since Uncharted. To. And of course, there's one simple reason why they do it because it works. The fact that Tenzin serves as proof of concept that the player and Nate can build relationships without so much as words being spoken simply by way of gameplay mechanics and interaction, I think, is remarkable. And truly, throughout future Naughty Dog games such as The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, Uncharted 3, they will very carefully pair the player and player character with other NPCs to alter the mood, emotion, and stress levels of the player. The point of this whole diatribe is to communicate just how important Uncharted 2 was for Naughty Dog as a studio. In the original game, there were certainly attempts at doing these things. However, in my opinion, none of those attempts were particularly successful. While I do have a lot of problems with Uncharted 2, and I think in many ways it hasn't aged well in comparison with other later Naughty Dog games, which I do recognize is a somewhat stupid thing to say considering that those games are newer and have therefore aged better since they have not aged as much, I still think that this game is probably the most important one that Naughty Dog ever created. You could argue that The Last of Us was the most important and transformative game that they ever made, considering it marked a real shift in their development process. 
and also that it marked the first time Neil Druckmann took a leadership position and he is now the vice president of Naughty Dog and the creative director on seemingly all of their future projects. However, I would argue that The Last of Us would never have happened unless the progress that was made in Uncharted 2 was made. If I had to explain it succinctly, I would say that Uncharted 2 is the first time that it feels as though the Naughty Dog of today got its feet under itself and began to bear its own weight. The original game was ambitious and actually suffered a lot because of it. There were so many ideas going around that nothing was done well, but many things were done even still. As the saying goes, jack of all trades, master of none. In other words, you can put on 10 different hats, but they probably look better individually as opposed to all mashed together. But to go back to the original statement at the top of this video, Uncharted 2 is successful in spite of its story, not because of its story. Yes, this is the first game that Naughty Dog seems to have ever created focused entirely on the narrative and character development. Which is why it's all the more confusing that the story is so bad. I understand that this was only their second outing trying to make a game like this, but even considering how cringy the end product resulted being, the game is still lauded today as one of, if not the, best in the franchise. And in fact, most people seem to cite the story as the reason for this exceptionalism. They may love the setting, have particularly fond memories of the building collapsing in Nepal, or for the picturesque train sequence at the beginning of the game, or the relationship that's built with Chloe, or one of the most infuriating boss battles of the entire PlayStation 3 generation. Whatever it is that they connected with, people are truly connected with it. This game means a lot to a lot of people, including myself. I've had very positive memories of Uncharted 2 for years. I didn't play it anywhere near launch, but when I did play it, at first I was blown away. However, after replaying it this most recent time for this video specifically, I can't help but feel as though I overlooked many shortcomings or outright ignored them. The game is almost entrancing in that way. It pulls people in and makes them fall in love with it, but when you look at the minutia of the game, there are many, many problems. Remarkably, however, the game works when consumed as a complete package. And this is actually one of the most frustrating things about making these videos for me as the creator, and perhaps even frustrating for you. You see, playing through games as critically and skeptically as possible can be fun at first. You're nitpicking every single glitch, poorly designed level, cringy joke, everything. And when you call these things out, it can make you feel as though you're more intelligent or perhaps even that your opinion is worth more than somebody else's opinion simply because you're criticizing the thing that they love. But after playing through Uncharted 2 again, I've realized that this is simply not the case. Uncharted 2 is ripe with gameplay, narrative, and level design issues, and it's really easy to nitpick each of those problems and come to the conclusion that the game must be terrible as a result. After all, how can a game be good and have so many issues? Yet, remarkably, I think Uncharted 2 is a game that is more than the sum of its parts. In the same way that a human being is simply a collection of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and a bunch of other smaller proportioned elements, yet is still worth more than the sum of those individual elements, I think that Uncharted 2 as an experience is worth more than the sum of its levels, gameplay mechanics, and writing. In many ways, I think that this is probably true for most games, and especially most great games. Maybe it's that they play into the cultural climate of the time, or connect with players on an emotional level that can't be quantified by the smaller individual parts, but regardless, the experience of the game is something more than would be predicted if hyper-analyzed. Now, the point of this video is not to discuss the philosophical implications of game design, as much as I would love to make false comparisons between video games and human body compositions for an hour, you likely came here for something else, an honest and impartial look at this game that so many people hold dear. And don't worry, I'm going to deliver that beginning in just a moment, but I just wanted to take this time and explain why I don't think that breaking things down in this way gives you a complete picture of what this game has to offer. In the same way that reading a Sparks Note booklet on a novel doesn't give you the same experience or knowledge as though you read the novel yourself. It may make you feel as though you're equipped to make or echo the criticisms that you've learned from the critique, but it certainly doesn't equip you to form an honest and fair opinion yourself. 
In other words, this is the world's longest spoiler warning. If you haven't played Uncharted 2, you should. The game is only around 10 to 11 hours long, and if you own a PS4, chances are you have it for free because it was listed under the PlayStation Plus free game of the month a little while back. And if you are like me, you likely saved it and downloaded it to your library even though you might not have had the intention of playing it immediately. I mean, free is free. Don't worry, this video will still be available to you once you've completed it over the course of a weekend, or knowing some of you, a single evening. But with all of that being said, we're going to go through a good number of my primary criticisms and frustrations with Uncharted 2. I'm going to go through the entire story start to finish, so once again, spoiler warning, and we're going to have the video broken up into four main acts. The intro, which is what you've been watching up until this point, the narrative, the gameplay, and the conclusion. And as always, I'll have timestamps included below. But with all of that said, let's get started. I want to begin by discussing the narrative of the game. As I said previously, this is what most people tend to cite as their reason for loving the game so much. They may point out the great action sequences or the characters that they connected with, but usually at the core they're referencing the story and the plot. So I'm going to run through a brief synopsis of the entire story from start to finish to refresh your memory if it's been a while since you played the game, or if you've never played the game at all and have no intention of doing so. Now as difficult as it's going to be, I'm going to desperately try and restrain my commentary until after I've gone through the entire game. To begin. Uncharted 2 takes place roughly two years after the events of the first game. We open up in a snowy mountainside with a train hanging off a cliff and Nathan Drake hanging out inside, clearly injured and abandoned, but the sequence only takes place for a couple minutes before we cut away into the main backstory of the game. We cut back in time to a tropical bar where Nathan Drake is approached by a former associate of his named Harry Flynn. But effectively, for the entirety of the story, they're just going to call him Flynn, so that's what I'm going to call him from now on. There's also a girl with him, named Chloe Frazier. She's going to be very important, especially in future videos when we go through Uncharted The Lost Legacy, so keep her in mind. But as for right now, she just seems to be a sidekick or girlfriend of Flynn's. These two petition Nathan Drake, somebody they previously worked with, to help them steal an old oil lamp that was apparently involved in some way, shape, or form in Marco Polo's doomed 1292 voyage from China. They talk about working for a wealthy benefactor that they're going to double cross, meaning that that they want Nathan Drake to help them get it so that they can double cross somebody else and share the profits. It's pretty standard as far as action movie plots go. Damn it, I'm already interjecting my opinions into the synopsis. Okay, uh, moving on. Nathan hesitates but eventually agrees to help these two. We have a couple of other cutaway sequences, one of which we see Chloe convince Nate, somebody with whom she previously had a romantic relationship with, to leave with her once they get their share of the treasure, and to basically double-cross Flynn in the process of double-crossing their wealthy benefactor. And no, this second double-crossing is not the last double-crossing that will take place over the course of this story. We cut forward to a museum in Istanbul, where Nate and Flynn are trying to break in to find and steal the lamp. And inside is a flammable resin that illuminates a message on the map that was also contained within, showing that Marco Polo's fleet was eventually shipwrecked in the middle of the voyage someplace in Borneo. Furthermore, it's also revealed that they were likely carrying the Chintamani Stone. Now we could go into a lot of the historical and legendary ramifications and implications of the Chintamani Stone, but basically all you need to know is that it's a massive sapphire from Shambhala, and apparently whoever wields it has unlimited power and can conquer the world. Again, it's pretty ordinary as far as action stories go. And, of course, because we know that this is going to grant unlimited power to whoever wields it, there's definitely going to be a bad guy that's trying to wield this power to control the world. But rest assured, we'll run into him soon enough. After this revelation is revealed to both Nate and to the player, Flynn double-crosses Nate in what could only be described as the most predictable double-crossing ever. But rest assured, if you love double-crossing, this is the story for you. Crisscross. This third double-crossing is not the final one. So Flynn double-crosses Nate, leaves him to be arrested, and we jump forward a few months, at which point we see Nate in a prison, sitting and going a little crazy. It's at this point we're reintroduced to Victor Sullivan from the original game, who has been summoned by Chloe to help free Nate from the prison. We get some exposition here basically saying that Flynn double-crossed Nate and Chloe because he's working for Lazarevich. Lazarevich being a Serbian war criminal who's looking for the stone to help him in his pursuits of controlling and ruling the world. 
We don't get a lot of backstory with Lazarevich, but it seems as though he has some sort of delusion of grandeur where he believes that he has to serve some broader purpose to help bring order to the chaos that exists within the planet. Again, these are pretty ordinary plot points as far as action movies go and action stories go. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. All I ask for in an action story with this type of villain is to give the villain the chance to argue their case to the viewer, or in this case, the player. In a movie such as Avengers Endgame, Thanos has a real argument for why he's doing what he's doing. Not saying it's a good argument, but it is an argument nonetheless. And the filmmakers made sure to give Thanos a chance to explain his case to the viewer so that they feel at least somewhat conflicted as to which side to take. In Uncharted 2, Lazarevich is hidden from the player for the majority of the story. There are a couple of minutes wherein he calls out Nathan Drake towards the end of the game, but don't worry, we'll get to that. Again, I'm really bad at not interjecting while giving a synopsis. Moving on. Nathan and Sully decide that they're going to infiltrate one of Lazarevich's camps in Borneo with Chloe as a secret agent of sorts within Lazarevich's group. After several gameplay sections, Nathan eventually discovers that the stone likely never left Shimbala in the first place. And Nate also finds a Furba and a map with a message that its carrier will be able to gain access to Shambhala through a temple that's located in Nepal. Flynn shows up with a bunch of angry men, they get spooked off, and naturally, Nate and Sully both escape. Now at this point, the game developers felt that they needed to shake it up and to break up the monotony of Nate and Sully by pairing Nate and Chloe together. So, they find some arbitrary reason for Sully to back out of the story and to give the player the chance to pair with Chloe. The two travel to Nepal and find that Lazarevich has already been there searching for the temple. During the course of going through these levels where we're being chased by Lazarevich's mercenaries, the player runs into Nate's ex-girlfriend from the first game. Elena Fisher. She's traveling with a cameraman who's just known as Jeff. Don't worry, it's not important. You'll find out why in just a little bit. And they are apparently tracking Lazarevich for some sort of story. Like I said in the last critique, this is something that's going to happen time and time again throughout the franchise. Nathan will be all alone at the beginning of the game with no mention of Elena, no explanation as to where she went, and then suddenly she'll reappear out of nowhere with everything seemingly being the same as always. Regardless, it's the same old, same old, and it's something we're going to be seeing a lot more of, so get used to it. After reconnecting with Elena and her new cameraman, boyfriend, hubby, whatever the hell he is, he's just a dude to be honest, we eventually progress with Nate and Chloe, Elena, and the cameraman to the temple. They use the weird dagger thing as a key to uncover Shambhala's real location in the Himalayan mountains. They start working their way back out but are ambushed, and during the course of this ambush, Jeff, the cameraman, is shot. There's a quick little debate that happens between Nate, Elena, and Chloe, where they're all arguing over whether or not to abandon the cameraman to escape. Chloe insists that they abandon him because he's already shot, likely going to die regardless, and Nate and Elena probably don't stand a decent chance of surviving if they stay behind with him. Elena, of course, is outraged at this proposition, and Nate, taking the side of his previous girlfriend, decides to help the cameraman, even though it likely means that they're going to die. And I really can't stress this enough. Like, he's walking this guy, carrying him on his shoulder. I mean, look at this. Like, he should be dead. <laughs> Regardless, you go through a couple sequences that are pretty clunky, and eventually Nate and Elena are caught by Lazarevich, who walks right up and kills Jeff. This seems like it was meant to be some sort of big reveal that Lazarevich is evil and a bad guy, but just judging by his look, we can tell he's the bad guy, and shooting an already dying character who we had no connection with doesn't really do much by way of convincing us that a character is evil for evil's sake. And it's too bad, because all this really would have taken was a couple scenes where Jeff the cameraman was given the chance to be a human being and to build a relationship with the player. But of course this is too much to ask in these early Naughty Dog games. Also in this sequence, because Chloe is still believed to be working with Lazarevich, she does a faux double cross to start working with Lazarevich to keep her cover. This isn't made super clear to the player or to Nate. In fact, Elena seems to think that Chloe is an outright double crosser and is actually working with 
Lazarevich and push them into this situation. Even though that doesn't really make a lot of sense because Chloe even said that she was trying to save everybody by leaving Jeff the cameraman behind. It it's it's just it's lame. <laughs> Can you tell I ran out of words there? <laughs> it's lame. After all of this, Nate escapes from Flynn and Lazarevich with Elena. After a brief argument, Nate and Elena decide to catch up to Lazarevich's train using a stolen jeep to try and help Chloe. This is probably the most memorable sequence of the entire game, at least for me. Climbing along and running atop the train through a vast mountain range is really, really cool. I don't know how they managed to do this so well, but it seems as though it's fluid and it's effortless. Really, other than this tunnel sequence, there's never a moment where it feels as though Naughty Dog is trying to give you the runaround or is trying to stall so that the player can move up the train to keep in line with the amount of track that's left. I don't really know how they did this, but their sleight of hand is phenomenal, and they were able to make sure that the player felt as though this was all organic, and when the train eventually crashes, it crashed because it just happened to crash, and not because the story was on strict tracks. In all likelihood, the way they got this working was probably using a dynamic speed on the train to make sure that it didn't move too fast to reach the end of the track before the player was ready, and also the train was so long that the player, no matter how fast they were moving, could never reach the front of the train before the giant explosion happened thanks to the helicopter. But all that's beside the point. The point is, this is awesome. And even today, it's impressive, which just goes to show you how crazy impressive it must have been at launch. So Nate fights his way through the train trying to find Chloe, but after finding her, she refuses to leave with him because she feels as though she can't trust him anymore. Flynn shows up out of nowhere and decides to shoot Nate. Trapped and dying, Nate decides to cause an explosion that's going to derail the entire train, a very reasonable thing to do. The train flies off the cliff and he escapes just barely while hanging onto the train car. And this is where the game opened up. It's like in one of those old 1990s comedy movies where they open up the movie with some clip and they say, oh, I bet you're wondering how I got here. And then they only reveal later how they got there. And it's, it's kind of a fun cliche, but I don't know. It doesn't do much for me. You climb back up the train car just like you did at the beginning of the game, but you get some new dialogue and quirky jabs, and some stuff has been slightly altered to a more realistic version, considering that they didn't have to dumb it down for the intro anymore. You get to the top of the train, you climb through the snow, and you start walking through the sequence, at which point Nate passes out due to all of the blood loss. Nate's found by a Tibetan Sherpa named Tenzin, the guy we talked about earlier, who brings Nate back to the village where he's based out of to help him recover. Here, Nate's reunited with Elena, and we are introduced to an explorer named Carl Schaefer, who's apparently some sort of German an explorer that's been living here for a while. Schaefer's probably the weirdest character in this entire story because he doesn't have really anything particularly likable about him. He just kind of shows up, offers some explanation, says that Lazarevich must be stopped at all costs, and then uses Tenzin to send Nate off on a fetch quest effectively to find out why Lazarevich actually must be stopped at all costs. You see, Schaefer sent an expedition of people to try and find the stone apparently decades ago, even though the condition of the bodies is not quite decades old. It's weird. Regardless, doesn't really matter. You travel through some ice caves doing a lot of platforming and fighting off these really strange monsters that are heavily implied to be yetis. Don't worry, these things will really piss you off in just a little bit. They're jumping up walls. They have superpowers. They can apparently withstand any number of bullets. They're one of the most infuriating NPCs in the entirety of the franchise. I can't stand them at all. I'm moving on. After finding the slaughtered expedition, you find out that Schaefer was actually working for and originated his resources from the Nazi think tank, the Ananurbe. This was a group founded by Heinrich Himmler in July of 1935. It's an actual group that actually existed. Basically, the Nazis were convinced that a bunch of pseudoscientific things existed all throughout the world. They were super, super pseudoscientific with regards to a lot of things, and they sent out groups and explorers to find all of these mythical places and sources of power. It, it's, it's crazy. I highly suggest you read into it. It's super interesting just how crazy these people actually were. Like for real, the Nazis were so superstitious. It's hilarious. But regardless, 
That's where Schaefer came from. And apparently he also killed his own men to protect the world from the Chintamani stone being released because it had this unknowable and uncontrollable power. I, you know what, Nazis have to be in an Uncharted game, I guess. It's just, it's what you need because Nazis, <laughs> that's it, because Nazis. We'll talk more about this in a little bit, but for now, We'll just leave it there. Nate and Tenzin return to the village at which they started to find that Lazarevich's men have arrived and have started tearing the place apart. Schaefer has been kidnapped and the furba, the little dagger thing, has been stolen. Elena thankfully is safe, so she and Nate follow Lazarevich's convoy to a monastery at the top of the mountain where a mortally wounded Schaefer tells Nate that he must destroy the Chintamani stone before Lazarevich can obtain its power. He also heavily suggests that Nate should kill anybody that gets in the way because he was also willing to kill his own men that got in the way of preventing the power from escaping. This is one of those topics that I could talk about for hours and we're going to discuss in a little bit the idea that Nathan Drake is actually a terrible person who's actually the bad guy throughout this entire story even though he's presented as the hero and not the anti hero. It's something that even Lozarevich will call him out on towards the end of the game, but its entire discussion is limited to a single sentence that isn't responded to. But don't worry, we'll get there. Nate runs back into Chloe while chasing Lozarevich, and they come to a decent understanding, and Nate regains the little dagger key thing. Seriously, I, I looked it up. It's called a fur, but I, I just, that sounds weird. It's like a furby, but a knife. I I don't like the name, I'm just gonna call it Dagger Thing. Nate and Elena eventually figure out the passageway to Shambhala by doing some basic puzzles, but they run into Lazarevich. Lazarevich takes Chloe and Elena hostage, realizing that Chloe has been an undercover agent this entire time, and he forces Nate and Flynn to open the pathway to Shambhala. Those super stupid monsters come out of nowhere again, but are eventually pushed off, and at that point he takes off the head of one in what I was expecting to be a very great gruesome display, but turns out they're just dudes. Yeah, these are the superhuman guardian people that apparently guard Shimbala and have superpowers, felt the need to cover themselves and disguise themselves as Yeti to keep people away for some reason. I, I don't really know why they needed to cover up and make themselves look like yetis when they could just look like people and that would probably do the job, but regardless, it's a thing. Furthermore, this is also one of the most underwhelming reveals in the entire franchise because they take this head off and they're just like, oh, it's dudes, cool. Nobody's questioning how they got these superhuman powers to the point where they're able to jump 20, 30 feet in the air, where they can withstand literal clips of ammunition shoved into their heads. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but everyone just kind of rolls over and accepts that it must be due to the power of the Chintamani stone. And if you're anything like me, you likely saw this reveal and immediately realized that the final boss battle was likely going to be Lazarevich hopped up on the same stuff. Moving on, the gate is open open to Shambhala. More guards come out of nowhere attacking everybody, but this provides enough cover for Nate, Elena, and Chloe to escape from Lazarevich. You fight off a few guardians in some really frustrating arena battles. Like for real, these guys, they have a DPS that's so high, you basically have to immediately run to cover and then spam them with some cheap attacks on their ankles. It's not really fun. It doesn't seem to require skill. It's purely a matter of finding an exploit and taking advantage of it. But Nate, Elena, and Chloe keep pushing through the city towards the main shrine at the center. Once they arrive there, they realize that the Chintamani stone is actually a giant ball of resin, and it's taken from the sap of this ancient tree of life that's at the center of the city. And apparently at the base of the tree, within the root system, there's a liquefied version of the sap that if you drink it, makes you effectively invincible. Or maybe I should say almost effectively invincible because it clearly doesn't make everybody invincible considering all of the guardians that you kill in the sequence leading up to this. Right after this reveal, Flynn shows up out of nowhere having been beaten and left for dead by Lazarevich because he screwed everything up and let Nate get away. Flynn has a grenade that he has unpinned and drops once he shows up, trying to commit some sort of suicide bombing on the group for 
reasons, I guess. Everybody seems perfectly fine despite all of the shrapnel flying everywhere, except for Elena, who seems to have absorbed most of the blow. Even still, she seems to just look like she fell down a flight of stairs. She doesn't really seem to have absorbed a lot of shrapnel that cut her up and is causing her to bleed to death. But regardless, we'll look past it. Now I immediately thought, okay, Elena's dying. Surely we're gonna get her to the base of the tree, give her some of the sap, and she'll be fine. But I guess Naughty Dog's writers didn't want to be that predictable in this individual instance of the game. So instead, Nate decides that he's going to push on to stop Lazarevich from getting to the sap, not because he needs it to heal Elena, but rather because he simply wants to defeat Lazarevich. It's a weird conflict of motivations because it seems as though Nate would be much more justified in going down to the base of the tree to get the sap to heal Elena, saying screw it to Lazarevich because Elena's more important to him than anything else. But because they flipped the motivations, Nate now is seemingly abandoning Elena and Chloe, putting them both in what I would argue is a moderate amount of danger, considering we've seen all of these guardians jumping and flying around in this very area where he leaves them. Also, he can just go and try to stop Lazarevich from drinking some tree sap. It's a small problem to have, perhaps, but it does seem as though this must have been a conscious choice on the part of the writers, to have Nate motivated by stopping Lazarevich as opposed to saving Elena. I don't know which I like more, because on the one hand, I think they felt that Lazarevich being stopped would perhaps be read as the more noble pursuit, but if they had flipped it and decided that Elena was definitely going to die without drinking some of the sap and Nate needs to collect that sap in order to save her, at which point he runs into Lazarevich and they have this fight out where Lazarevich happens to die and the tree is destroyed in the process, they could have achieved literally all of the same things while motivating Nate's actions by the saving of this love interest. It makes me think as though Naughty Dog didn't actually plan on Nate and Elena reconnecting when they were initially writing these the sequence but the game ends with them together anyway so I really don't know what to make of it it's just weird to me if you have any thoughts on this I'd love to hear them in the comments Nate travels down to the base of the tree within the root system and finds Lazarevich who's drinking the tree sap becoming nearly invincible totally roided out and it's in this small arena that the most frustrating boss fight of the entire franchise takes place really playing back through this for this video was an absolute trudge I forgot how terrible this was. I, I really am baffled at how stupid this is. Let's just all take a minute to be silent and appreciate that this type of crap is not a mainstay of the industry nowadays. Okay, we're good. You run around, shoot little pockets of resin that explode near Lazarevich, which deals damage to him, or you can just unload all of your ammo into him, but that seems to do very little damage comparatively. So you run around shooting little pockets of resin, blowing up in his face. You repeat this process time and time again for about 10 minutes, and eventually, Nate's killed him, and he leaves him to be devoured and torn apart by the Guardians. The most important sequence here, though, is what Lazarevich says to Nate in this little moment of transparency where the writers seem to be admitting one of the major plot holes of this franchise. You think I am a monster, but you're no different from me, Blake. How many men have you killed? How many just today? That's it, boy. No compassion, no mercy. Do it! No. <laughs> Nate doesn't have a response to this, and it begs the question, why was this thrown out by the main villain at the end of the game if it's never really resolved? Seriously, this could have led to some really cool moments leading into the conclusion of the story, where Nate is totally torn as to whether or not he did the right thing or if he's the actual villain in all of this. Maybe Lazarevich actually could have done some good by obtaining the power of the Chintamani Stone, and maybe the hundreds of people that Nate killed in the process of chasing down this stone wasn't actually worth it 
Maybe that made him a worse individual than everybody else. Now, over the last few months, I've been rereading the Witcher books. They're all fantastic, and I recommend them fully. But in the very first book, we're exposed to Geralt's philosophy with regards to gradations of good and evil. During the story of how Geralt became the Butcher of Blaviken, we find out that Geralt is constantly presented with the offer to choose between one of two evils. The argument usually goes like this. Here's an option. Here's another option. One is less terrible than the other, therefore it's only moral to choose the less terrible option. One of the things you need to know about Geralt as a character is that he rejects this premise. He says that choosing between the lesser of two evils is a false dichotomy. It's a choice that you don't have to make. And this is actually a common thread throughout all of the Witcher books. This struggle that Geralt has trying to decide whether or not he should choose between the lesser of two evils, even though he is fundamentally and emphatically opposed to the premises of that argument. That's an interesting discussion to have. That's an interesting struggle for a character to be wrestling with. You compare that to Nathan Drake, who basically never deals with any of these problems throughout the entire franchise. Like I said in the last critique, a lot of these problems can be adequately explained away to most people by simply saying, it's a video game, or it's an action game. It's not meant to be super serious. You're not meant to question a lot of these things. But that to me seems like a really lazy excuse, because if you're asking the player to connect with these characters, you need to at least have a somewhat decent explanation as to why they're committing these crimes. But you know what? I've discussed this time and time again. I don't think it's something that Naughty Dog will ever resolve in the Uncharted series simply because I don't think it's important to them. I would love to see them tackle it, but I just don't think it's going to happen. And having played through all of the games developed by the primary studio at Naughty Dog, it doesn't seem like something they ever really addressed. The Last of Us Part Two shows that they're capable of handling this discussion because they're showing very actively because the overarching premise of that game is that evil begets evil and the actions of one character are not contained within a vacuum. They must be considered as individual moral actions. But as far as Uncharted is concerned, for the most part, what happens in cutscenes is canon and should be considered within the character evaluation of an individual, not the gameplay sequences, which occur in a sort of alternate realm. Regardless, the game ends as the city crumbles under the collapse of the tree, with all of the exploding resin that Nate caused. After escaping the collapsing Shambhala, Nate and Chloe have drug Elena to the top of this set of stairs. Naughty Dog is clearly trying to imply that she is dying here, or at least almost about to die, I guess. And Nate starts freaking out and crying, and it's very emotional. Everybody watching this is convinced that this fade in is meant to be some sort of funeral service. At the very least, Nate appears to be paying respects to a deceased individual, and based on what they just did, it seems as though that individual should be Elena. But it's not. This is actually a memorial for Schaefer. Yeah, the old German Nazi guy, that's, that's his memorial and it's it's not Elena. Elena's fine and uh, they talk, share some cute couple tidbits and then they kind of kiss and hang out and then the game's over. That's it. And this is what I mean by Naughty Dog always chickening out with this franchise. In the first game, it seemed as though they were killing off Sully. They chickened out, brought him back to life after being shot in the chest with a small booklet that somehow stopped a bullet. This time around, Elena survived a grenade launch to the face simply because they wanted to have a cute couple scene at the end of the game. Nate literally abandoned Elena and Chloe to go back down to the base of the tree to try and stop the acquisition of unlimited power by an evil character. Sometimes, doing the right thing has a cost. If Naughty Dog had committed to that principle and killed off Elena here, that could have proven the point. Nate saved the world, or at least he thinks he did, but he lost his true love in the process. And this is a question that Naughty Dog is very capable of asking the player because they do so in The Last of Us. That's literally the whole point of the end of the game. I understand it's not really the tone that they're going for in Uncharted, but still, it leaves me frustrated that they couldn't have some more serious subject matter within the game. And, and that's it. That is the actual end of the game. It's pretty underwhelming, if you ask me. I mean, there's a lot of things that we could discuss with regards to this. We could talk about the Nazi tie-in, their kind of dependency on bringing those characters in wherever they can, which is one thing that you kind of just do 
do, which I think is actually forgivable for the most part, even if it does start to get a little tired. The one thing I can't forgive though is Naughty Dog's lack of commitment to any sort of serious consequence as a result of Nate's actions. There are multiple points in Uncharted 2 where Chloe and or Elena are held at gunpoint and are almost killed because of something Nate did directly. However, instead of the universe actually punishing Nate, they decide to give him a free pass so that he effectively never has to learn his lesson. They sort of address this in Uncharted 4 where they sort of kill off Nate's brother in a cutscene that took place in the past, but as we all know who have played through that game, the brother reappears and is absolutely fine, so that doesn't count. And this is probably my single biggest problem with the franchise that happens time and time again. Nate is horrifically irresponsible. He does a lot of very stupid things, and there are many times, especially in these early games, where he's doing things seemingly just for the laugh that endanger everyone around him. He's arrogant, he's cocky, he's full of himself, and he pushes those around him into dangerous situations. Even if his motivations are sound, such as at the end of Uncharted 2 when he pushes in to stop Lazarevich, it still means that he's endangering those around him. And if he's actually doing that, there should be some sort of consequence. Show the player and Nate that there's a cost to moral action. But regardless, the story serves a broad purpose to bring the player along for an action-packed ride. We can nitpick all of these small little details, such as the strange use of Yeti costumes for these superhero level guardians to scare off strangers from Shambhala even though that doesn't seem to be necessary. I mean, I think you could just have regular looking people that have superpowers doing the job and people would be terrified. Like, I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I still don't know why this was necessary. Or the fact that you are in a vast mountainscape, you go through these stairs and then all of a sudden you come out to Shimbala, which seems to just be within a mountain valley and has the sky completely open to it. Like, for real, did they not have helicopters to just fly over the mountain? I mean, they had helicopters like 10 minutes before this happened, so surely they were able to fly and find Shambhala this way. Why did they have to go underground? Is this whole thing underground with a fake sky? If so, how did that happen? Like, there's so many questions that we could bring up. It's just not important. And I don't think it's important because I don't think there's any good answer to it. The broader point of this section of the video is just that the narrative isn't very good. The character development isn't very good, though it is better than the previous game, and the individual minutia of characters interacting with each other is interesting, but the broader implications of those interactions are cut off before anything interesting develops. So what else does the game have to offer? Well, it's gameplay. Over the course of Uncharted 2, there's a lot of crazy scenes. The ones that I remember most fondly would be the helicopter and train sequence, the opening sequence on the train, and the building collapsing, which I know for many people was the first thing that they ever saw about Uncharted 2 in the original demo at E3 back in the day, and even still, it's remarkably impressive, especially when you consider the hardware that this game was running on. However, in spite of these massive set pieces, there is a real lack of polish that I noticed while playing back through the game recently. There seems to be a lack of attention to detail in smaller areas within the gameplay sequences. Cutscenes are always great, and big story beat moments are always polished to high hell. However, within smaller gameplay sequences, it seems as though they didn't focus test these very much at all. Granted, these are all small things, but when added together, it makes the game feel as though there wasn't much care put into it, at least when compared to Naughty Dog of just a few years later. For example, I was able to climb onto this ladder early before Chloe showed up simply because I jumped on this desk and was able to get on the ladder from there. This wasn't supposed to happen. Seriously, you climb to the top of the ladder and you can't get through because that door has to be opened by Chloe once you climb to the top of the ladder with her. Or we could look at this moment where we're running through the temple with Chloe, we fall into a trap and the ceiling closes down. We're locked in a cold dark room, scary enough. However, Spikes appear, and the roof starts slowly collapsing in. This could have been a moment that instilled a lot of stress and fear in me, the player. But it was completely negated 
by what was supposed to be a helpful tip from the game. You see, when I critique and review games, I try to play through them in the way that most people will play through them. That usually means that I'll approach them with the normal difficulty and go back through later with higher levels of difficulty. I will also leave most settings on the default option, at least for the majority of the game, so once again, I play through the game in the same way that the majority of players will experience it. This meant that for Uncharted 2, I left most of the tutorial hints on. And this is one of those moments where I'm both glad and disappointed that I did. I'm glad I did because now I can call out what is a horribly optimized tip in this moment. And I'm frustrated because this tip that popped up completely spoiled the entirety of this sequence. Like I said, we just fell in a trap. Spikes appeared out of nowhere and the ceiling is collapsing in on us. This should be a scary moment, but instead, a little tutorial hint popped up immediately suggesting that I throw a grenade. This means that instead of being resourceful, thinking outside the box, and connecting that, ooh, maybe I should break down those gears that seem to be operating the ceiling mechanism. At which point I would probably start shooting at it and hucking grenades in that general direction, solving the puzzle for myself. But instead, a tutorial popped up immediately spoiling the solution to the puzzle from the outset. This totally ruined the entire moment for me, making it so the entire experience was over before I knew it. Really, really disappointing. Or I could point out this really poorly placed cart. We need to push this over a little bit to jump on it, and how you do that is by going to a particular side and, and pressing circle in order to crouch next to it, at which point you can push against it into the right position. However, I pressed circle twice. So I ran around this corner, I got to the cart, pressed circle, and immediately jumped to the ledge and then fell off. It happened so quick, I didn't even really process what happened until I went back and watched the footage over again. All they needed to do was extend the floor a little bit so that this wouldn't happen, or to put a simple script in place so that the player would not be able to go to the ledge when a cart is that close to it. Or even just a small barrier along this edge, really, it wouldn't have taken much. It just makes me think that they didn't test this enough to realize that this could potentially be a problem. And there's a a lot of problems throughout the game like this. But even still, there are also a lot of moments where the attention to detail is really impressive and where you can tell a lot of care was given. Something like Nate's notebook I find super cool and I find it to be a really impressive improvement over the previous game. The fact that you can find little notes that Nate's written to himself helps you get in the mind of the character and I think it's super cool. But there's also a lot of decisions that were made in the game design of Uncharted 2 that seem to be just strange. The most notable one would probably be in the free climbing. This is something I see a lot of people talk about, and it's something I had completely forgotten about before returning to the game for this video. You see, there's very little or no markings at all indicating where you can or should free climb. Usually, the extent of your indications are just small stones sticking out of a wall. You, as the player, have to see these stones and infer from that information that you can climb along that wall. Now, this could be an understandable design choice as it targets realism, but it does cause more frustration than not because it isn't consistent. You don't need to add markings to indicate where you can free climb if those markings are reductive, or if those markings don't serve a reasonable purpose or pull the player out of the game. In a game like Assassin's Creed, there is really no need for any sort of these indications, because you can effectively climb on anything, so these indications would be needless. However, because in Uncharted 2, there are very specific areas you can and can't climb, this just leads to more frustration. Compare it to something like Uncharted 4, where there are markings. These markings are discreet enough that you do have to look for them, but they make it so if the player processes that they need to climb in a given level, they know what to look for. Because you can't climb everything in Uncharted 4, you start just looking for these markings which indicate what you are allowed to climb. And because they're minimalistic, I feel as though these markings aren't intrusive or unimmersive. 
Not to mention, I think it's pretty clear that the return of these markings in Uncharted 4 and Lost Legacy really shows that Naughty Dog listened to the criticism and decided that the lack of markings, while an interesting design choice, targeting realism really wasn't worth the immersion that they were trying to achieve as a result. There were multiple times where I was confused as to where I was supposed to go because I didn't connect that I was supposed to jump onto this thing that wasn't marked. Most things in Uncharted, even the majority of things, in Uncharted that aren't marked, you cannot interact with. So the assumption follows through all gameplay systems, where if something is not specialty marked, it isn't interactive. The fact that these street signs are climbable is something you aren't going to know unless you try jumping for them. After you do this the first time, you'll eventually learn that these street signs can be climbed, but that's something you have to experiment with first. This means that there were also multiple times where I tried jumping at things to climb them which weren't interactive, because they also were not marked, so I assumed that maybe I just needed to try it in order to learn that you could climb them. I mean, just in explaining this, I find myself getting a headache because it seems so needlessly complicated, and I think that that's the main point. It's good they were trying to target realism and remove these unnecessary markings. The problem is, that they're necessary. Lastly, within the gameplay systems, there's a real lack of dynamism. Naughty Dog games have always been linear. You're always expected to continue on set paths and do what the developers intended you to do. That's not a bad thing. In fact, you can have a lot of amazing sequences that are carefully designed by the developers that are set up this way. However, there needs to be a sleight of hand. You need to convince the player that they have the free will to do what they want to do even though they're actually living their life in accordance with your dictum. For example, in Uncharted 4 there's the famous car sequence which was shown off at E3. Here you're running away from an armored car. You're driving through the city and taking all sorts of detours to try and avoid that car that's chasing you. The player really does feel as though they have the free will to turn in any direction, go through any alleyway they want, but because they're so rushed and pushed by the impending danger of the armored car, they find themselves just driving downhill as fast as they can. This is remarkably well done because it doesn't make the player feel as though they're on train tracks, but in reality, they are. No matter which corners you turn, no matter where you spin around, you will always end up in the same place, and the same cutscene will play at the end of the chase no matter what. That's why you'll hear a lot of developers talk about funneling wide. You open up a wide area for the player to go through, but you eventually funnel them into one small area that you dictate. The key is to make sure that the player doesn't realize they're being funneled into this singular point. In Uncharted 2, they don't do a very good job of this. For instance, here, Nathan is wounded and he is fighting for his life. He's surrounded by a bunch of armed gunmen, so I naturally thought that if I could stealth my way out of the level, climbing to safety, that would be fine. I don't have to kill unnecessarily, and I can get to safety where I will be able to recover from my injuries. But once you get to this area, you climb up the ledge, no matter who you've killed, no matter whether or not you are visible in this moment, you will immediately face a kill screen. People will show up out of nowhere and shoot you. This means that the player is forced to kill all of these people, even though within the game itself, it's not necessary. Furthermore, within the narrative itself, it doesn't make sense for Nate to kill these people because he's injured and likely doesn't stand a chance if he were to engage with them. So it would beg the question, why engage? Why not stealth your way out if you can? And this example is really frustrating, especially because there isn't really a reason that Naughty Dog needed to force the player to kill these characters. There's a couple waves that come in, but eventually you still climb up this same ledge. The same cutscene plays whether or not you killed 10 people behind you or 200 people behind you. Furthermore, I wish there were more realistic puzzles. I understand that this is an artifact of these kind of action adventure games where you just have to do these kind of outrageous puzzles where you're climbing on limbs of statues to alter their arrangement and then you're also climbing along these giant levers to pull them into place and then moving these small little statues onto set pillars to make sure that everything is lined up. It, like, I get it. 
I, I get it, you have to have puzzles in these games. I just wish that they put a little more effort into making those puzzles more realistic. So if there were people, ancient people, that wanted to hide a treasure, it would be more in line with what you would expect from them in hiding their treasure. But I do admit that this is likely just a pet peeve of mine, especially considering how many of these games I've played in the last few months. And lastly, the gunplay. There really isn't a major improvement over the previous game here. The shooting is still arena based, there's a wider variety of weapons, but for the most part you're just running through levels, unloading clips into enemies, finding a new gun, unloading that clip into somebody, finding a new gun, and repeating the process over and over and over again. In Uncharted 3 and 4 we'll start to see some more stealth sequences becoming normative within these games, but it's just unfortunate that in Uncharted 2, they felt as though they needed to keep to this purely action genre where you have to shoot and kill everything. The one improvement I can admit they did make over the original game is they added a lot more verticality to these levels. Most of the shooting arenas have two or three levels to them that you have to all consider and run around. Later in the game, there's even free running that's implemented into the levels in which you're fighting. It's actually pretty cool. But all told, the gameplay itself isn't particularly remarkable at the end of the day. So, with all of that said, what is the takeaway from Uncharted 2? There seems to be a lot of problems. How could this game be so beloved by so many? That's a question I am having a lot of trouble answering right now. I even have very fond memories of Uncharted 2, like I said at the beginning of the video. But, having replayed it for this video, I can't help but feel as though there's a real shortcoming here. There are so many gameplay and narrative shortfalls that it can't really be ignored, and yet, the game at the end of the day, once you've played it all the way through, fills you with a decent amount of satisfaction and, for the most part, motivates players to come back for more. I don't really know how to resolve the idea in my mind. Maybe you have a very elegant way of thinking about it and describing it. I would love to hear that in the comment section or through direct messages on Twitter or Instagram. I think Uncharted 2 is a good game. Not great, but not bad. But after playing through it again, I think I can say confidently that it's not actually my favorite of the franchise. If it is your favorite of the franchise, I would actually really be interested in hearing when you played the game last, or if you played it through recently, and what you would say in response to these criticisms I've levied. The only conclusion I can draw is the one I brought up at the beginning that Uncharted 2 is more than the sum of its parts. A game like Uncharted is about the journey and the experience. It's not really about the individual destinations that you arrive at during the course of that journey. While that may seem like a cop-out, and it may very well be just that, I'm glad that I played Uncharted 2 once again, and I'm excited to play through the third game for the next critique. As always, if you want videos like this to come out more frequently, or if you'd like to see them early, head over to Patreon right now, throw even a dollar my way, and you can be featured in the video such as these individuals right here. And depending upon the tier at which you join, you can even get a vocal shout out such as Zachary Johnson, Mike Holland, and Einar G. I really do appreciate the support of all of you patrons. Really, you guys are all stars. Furthermore, if you support me over on Patreon, you get a direct vote in what the next critique is, which it looks like based on the recent votes, we might even be going to The Last of Us Part Two, expediting that critique before we get to Uncharted 3. Should be pretty fun. I can't wait. But that's all for me. Thank you for watching. I love you all, and I'll see you in the next video.